poisons, in particular uh, lead poisoning. Personally, I'm infuriated that this is still a topic of discussion before the nation. But with big problems, we have to be methodical. Um, the solutions are available, but we haven't exercised them in the way we need to. Uh, it makes sense financially. WHO, World Health Organization, has concluded that for every dollar we spend on lead hazard control, we get back at least $17 uh, in benefits. Now, that's better, slightly better, than even vaccines. So we need to exercise these solutions to make sense. And the third message I want to underscore here, here is that the bigger abatement programs like HUD or drinking water, they cannot work if the CDC surveillance system is not adequately funded. And we're kind of eroding that right now. We won't know how to properly target our resources where they can do the most good if CDC is not full bore. So I'll close with some comments on, on that. But uh, uh, I think I want to turn to what exactly are the solutions. Uh, this was a handout that I think we gave you at the door, but these are a f at least some of the policies that the nation has enacted over the decades to combat childhood lead poisoning, going all the way back to 1971. The blue line is the average population uh, blood lead level. So you see that line has come down. So this is sort of the good news uh, in, in the sense that what we have done has been at least partially uh, successful. Um, now you'll notice, of course, that not a lot has happened in lead uh, policies and so forth uh, since 2012, four years ago, and that was just a revision of the CDC blood lead level of concern. So a lot of these things need to be updated. Now, so that was the good news. Here's the bad news. Um, I don't have a point here, but I know this is a little bit busy, but this is sort of, uh, we still swim in the sea of lead, is the bottom line. Most of our work has been up around the developmental toxicity level, the CDC blood lead level of concern. You'll see that at the top. The so-called natural background blood lead level is down way below that. So our population blood lead level now is around one microgram per deciliter. Uh, the prehistoric so-called natural background blood lead level is 0.016. That means we're still 100 times over where we need to be. We have many, many sources and pathways of exposure that have not been adequately addressed. So what we need to do is identify both the sources and the pathways of exposure. Why are they both important? We, we need source control to basically deal with it in a long-term system, but we also need to understand how the lead in the pipes or in the paint is actually getting into children's bodies so that we can quickly interrupt those exposure pathways and make sure that they are safe both immediately and by source control in the long run. So we need to act on both. And that's a challenge in, in the policy sector because as many of you know, what we often do is band-aids, right? Something pops up like Flint or Zika and then we'll do something quick and then we'll move on without having a long-term solution. Uh, so in terms of interrupting exposure pathways, what that means in this context is for water, we do corrosion control, we do filtration. If we have to, we do bottled water. In the housing context, we can stabilize the deteriorated lead-based paint, do some dust removal, and immediately protect the children. Uh, but we also have to do this long-term approach, whether it's pipe replacement or full-blown paint abatement, such as through replacing windows, the windows have the highest source of lead paint and lead dust compared to any other component. So um, uh, in my intro, we mentioned that in 2000, uh, the federal agencies uh, released the first comprehensive plan to address this problem in 10 years. Uh, it didn't happen. We didn't meet our goal in 2010. Why? Because uh, the integrated interagency budget request was not funded the way in which it needed to be. So you kind of uh, get what you pay for. Um, so we have a long ways to go. Uh, and that's why I think the methodical approach is really still before us. Um, so just, I just wanted to give you a few stats. I'm a scientist too, so I gotta give you some numbers. Uh, <laughs> these are data from the uh, American Healthy Housing Survey, just to underscore how important uh, this problem actually is. We have over nearly 24 million homes, almost a quarter of our nation's housing stock, with significant lead-based paint hazards. That means uh, deteriorated lead-based paint above a certain surface size, uh, contaminated house dust and lead in uh, bare soil. Uh, about almost four million homes have lead paint uh, uh, hazards.
advisors with children, and 1.1 million of those households are low-income households. Uh, we know that low-income households have a higher prevalence, as do African-American households. Uh, you'll notice there that households that get government assistance actually are somewhat safer. Uh, that's because there are standards in place, and, and the subsidies are often tied to making sure that those homes are safer. Uh, nevertheless, 12% of them, and of course, a lot of federal aid assisted housing is privately owned, but 12% of them have hazards compared to the unassisted housing stock, which is 22%. And so the needs, frankly, are the highest in the unassisted uh, low-income stock. Um, okay, so, so basically uh, what I wanna, uh, uh, we had a handout that basically, our view of the, what, what the methodical approach should be this. We need to uh, find out exactly where these lead problems are. Uh, we still don't know exactly which surfaces in our nation's housing stock has lead paint on them and lead paint hazards. We don't know exactly which homes have lead pipes. That could be a problem. So we need to identify the problem. Once we know exactly where they are, then we could proceed to uh, methodically address them using both the short and the long-term approach. And, and just to drive it home, the example would be, think you have a, a leaking roof. Well, you could patch the roof, right? That will stop the leak in the near term, but the time is gonna come when you have to replace the roof. Right? So we need to do both. We need to find ways to do capital improvements uh, so that we address the long term as well as the uh, short term. Uh, as I mentioned, the regulations are out of date. We've learned a lot of science uh, since then. The science is not adequately reflected in the federal regulatory framework uh, and it needs to be done. Um, so in the 2000 report, uh, we identified what full funding would look like over a 10 year period to address the problem. Uh, for the CDC, that was something on the order of 35 to $50 million a year. Uh, many states still do not adequately report their blood lead levels in their children in their high-risk populations to CDC. Uh, the HUD program uh, requires at least $230 million a year uh, for 10 years. Now, these numbers were in 2000, so we need, to be, we need to update them, and we will be doing that in short order. So the solutions exist. I mean, we know how to address this problem. Uh, we should. Uh, not just keep reacting. Most of the time in this country, health departments chase children who have already been poisoned, and then after their blood lead levels arise to some level, then we might act to prevent the exposure. So instead of testing children, why not test our houses? Why not test our pipes? Find out where the problem is, and then act on that knowledge so that, uh, so that our children are protected and our future is, is a bright one. Um, so uh, that's what I have. Thank you very much.